All right, Catherine, what's your next pick? Well, my second Native American pick is the sophomore novel from Tommy Orange. It's a sequel to his debut, There, There, sort of. The book is Wandering Stars, and it begins back in 1864 in the aftermath of a real event in American history, the Sand Creek Massacre in Colorado. And once again, I have to admit, I know nothing about this event, which makes me feel awful because I grew up in Colorado. But if I learned this, which I doubt, I've forgotten. It was an attack by the U.S. Army on a Native American settlement. Wandering Stars is one of the survivors, so he's sent to an army prison where he's forced to renounce his native identity and adopt Christianity. One of the guards is a religious zealot who believes he needs to kill the Indian to save the man. And that is a direct quote because this is a real life character. This is a man from history. The next generation in the story is Wandering Star's son, who's sent to an Indian boarding school where one of his only friends is a young girl named Opal. The schoolmaster is the same guard from the prison. In the present day, Opal is the aunt to Orville Redfeather, the boy almost killed in the school shooting in There, There. So there's the circle completed. I don't think you need to read there, there though. I believe this is still a standalone. Yeah. That'll be interesting to figure that out. Right. He is a powerhouse writer who drives home his points with such force and clarity. All you can do is receive them. He has no time for the blame game or inducing guilt. He is simply presenting truths that have been conveniently ignored for far too long. The massacre and the prison guard are both factual. And that he can do this in a way that keeps my attention firmly on the page, even when I'm uncomfortable, is one of the reasons I'm so happy he has a new book out. That's Wandering Stars, and it will be available on March 5th. I think this is one of the highly anticipated books of 2024. I bet it is. Did you ever read There, There? I did not read There, There. But I know it won a bunch of awards, or at least was in the conversation for a bunch of awards. That might be an interesting backlist one for you. It's been long enough. Yeah, for sure. All right. My next pick is my wild card pick. (gasps) Okay, here we go. It is possibly my weirdest pick of the day. Definitely my riskiest, but also there is upside, I think. And I will tell you why. (laughs) So the book is Say Hello to My Little Friend by Janine Capo Cruset, and it's coming out March 5th. The plot is completely out there. I'm going to attempt to succinctly describe it. (laughs) Well, the title is based on a completely... Do you know where it's from? Garface. Yep. Isn't it Al Pacino? Yep. Yep. So that plays a part in the story. Okay. It was intended to be taken from Scarface. Okay. All right. So our main character is Izzy, and he is a Pitbull impersonator, like the musician Pitbull. But he has to quit this gig when he gets a cease and desist letter from the actual Pitbull's legal team. He then decides to fashion himself after Tony Montana instead of Pitbull. And for those who don't know, I didn't know actually to look this up. Tony Montana is the main character in Scarface. He rose from Cuban immigrant to Miami drug lord. Let's put that there. (laughs) Also, Izzy befriends an orca, which is a killer whale. What? That is housed in the Miami Sea Aquarium and delves into the underbelly of Miami to learn the truth about his escape from Cuba. Wait. So there's a lot of weird and random stuff going on here. I was going to say, how? yeah, how are these all going to link together? That is the big question. And that is why this is my wild card pick. I'll say. Okay. I realize that this plot seems like not up my alley at all. And it doesn't. Sarah, honestly, yeah, I cannot believe that this is on your list. So I'm going to get to why this is on my list. Okay. First of all, one other thing that makes me nervous about this book is that other than the premise is totally out there and could go really, really wrong or be amazing and be so fresh that there's no read alike for it, right? That's why it could go either way. It's not going to be in the middle, I don't think. 
so the publisher is calling this Moby Dick meets Scarface. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in reading Moby Dick ever. No one does. And I don't really generally love drug dealer plots. So I don't know. We'll have to see. But here's why I am open to this. First of all, I'm trying to be more open to ridiculous plots after loving Shark Heart last year. That's true. And there are particular reasons why this weirdness is appealing to me. Number one, I loved Capo Crusette's memoir, My Time Among the Whites. This is not her first attempt at fiction. She has written another novel, but this is my first time reading her fiction. She was born and raised in Miami to Cuban parents, and I'm interested in the perspective she'll bring to the story. The publisher is calling this darkly comic, which I do love. And the fact that this totally weird plot is darkly comic, like makes it a little easier to swallow for me. The story is told from Izzy's and Lolita's perspectives. So there is a perspective told from an orca whale. Oh, kind of like remarkably bright creatures. Marcello. Exactly. Okay. But that would normally make me nervous, but I have read a chapter told from Lolita's perspective already, and I really liked it. I did sample the first chapter in the beginning of the next two chapters, and I really loved the writing. And apparently Lolita does have some very human-like personality characteristics, so that might make me, you know, able to connect with her as a character. The setting of Miami is apparently a full-on character in this story, and I love when that happens. And Kirkus also gave it a starred review and called it unclassifiable and unforgettable. Oh. Sameness has been kind of an issue in my reading lately. So that's another reason I'm taking a risk on this. Fingers crossed it doesn't crash and burn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say. Or get eaten by the orca, maybe I should say. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Oh, I'm very intrigued. You can vet this one for me. Yeah, I will. Say Hello to My Little Friend by Janine Capo Crusette, and it's coming out March 5th. Catherine, what is your next pick? Well, this pick should be a shoe in okay, because it's from one of our favorite authors, but I'm actually a little apprehensive. The author is the fabulous Anna Quinlan, and the novel is After Annie. Annie is a wife and mother to four young children when she dies unexpectedly. The story is about how her husband, children, and best friend cope without her. I'm nervous because this sounds quiet. As far as I can tell, the novel's premise is grief and how each of these people responds to the loss of someone so integral to their life. I have no doubt about Quinlan's writing and that she understands other women and can portray their innermost feelings accurately. My guess is that this is going to be as much about the past as the present and that Annie, although dead, is still going to be a vital character. I'm just uncertain about a story like this right now. I've only read one bit of true literary fiction, and it was hard. Quinlan's writing has always resonated with me. Even if a plot felt a bit wonky, there were women experiencing things I could easily understand. I'm just not sure I have the emotional capacity right now for a novel about grief and loss. But given the compassion that comes through in Quinlan's writing, I'm hoping this will ultimately be about growth through adversity and how love shapes us. And that's after Annie and it comes out March 5th. I'm obviously really looking forward to this too. I would look forward to hearing Anna Quinlan's take on grief and loss. That could be something that would feel really good to me right now. Exactly. Following the loss of my mom, right? I mean, I mean, it was like a year and a half ago, but. That's not very long. I know, I know. Yeah. But I, I too am nervous because I thought her last novel, Alternate Side, was pretty boring. Right. Part of me wonders if like, you know, some legendary authors get to the point in their career when they're still writing books, but nobody's really editing them or giving them feedback because they're so legendary. And so kind of the quality drips off a little bit. I hope she's not there. Right. Oh, me too. We'll have a good talk about this during the circle back. <laughs> yeah. All right. My last pick is my second sports fiction of the day. This time we are focusing on the radical intimacy of physical competition. That's per the publisher. This is Headshot by Rita Bullwinkle. It's coming out March 12th and it's a debut. This story follows eight female teenage boxers as they compete for a national title in Rio, Nevada. And the author is a former competitive athlete. She was the captain of a Division I water polo team, which that is really cool, actually. That's a very sort of out there sport. Right. 
especially for women. But she understands what it's like to be in intense competition. And I do wonder why she chose boxing. Right. Like I kind of would have be, I would be interested in a book about women's water polo. (laughs) Right. I agree. But regardless, I love the way this is structured. Each chapter covers a fight at this tournament and it goes into the past and futures of the two competitors fighting. So you've got these fights and then you're getting the backstory as well as sort of what's going to happen with the two competitors. It explores the quote, desire, envy, perfectionism, madness, and sheer physical pleasure that motivates young women to fight. And I love this break from gender norms and celebration of personality traits that are sort of necessary for athletic success. Not sort of necessary. They are necessary for athletic success, but they are much more, quote, acceptable by society in men than in women. So what happens to female athletes that need these qualities for success, but then they're kind of frowned upon out in the real world for having these qualities because they're not feminine enough or whatever. Also, this book got another starred review from Kirkus, and Kirkus says it has the momentum of a sports novel told in elevated literary language. Ooh. Yeah. So this is like a literary sports novel. Also, it's only 224 pages. Oh, nice. Yeah. And that's Headshot by Rita Bullwinkle coming out March 12th. Catherine, what is your last book? Well, my previous choice had me a little nervous, but my final winter pick has me almost scared, but in the best way possible. (laughs) We have a lot of nerve wracking picks today, by the way. I know we did. It's Percival Everett's James, and it's another retelling. It's a retelling of Huckleberry Finn. Oh, from the perspective of Jim, the slave who accompanies Huck. So that answers your question about what am I going to do when they run out of Greek myths to retell? I see. There are so many classics written. But I'm interested in classic retellings. Yes. Oh, I love them. Because I don't want to actually go read the classic, but I will read a retelling. Exactly. No, I love it. I read Huckleberry Finn so long ago, I can barely remember it, except to say it's about Huck and Jim rafting down the Mississippi to find safety for themselves. Huck is a white boy with an abusive father, and Jim is trying to escape slavery. The main reasons I chose this book without hesitation are, one, I'm a huge fan of the classics being retold, as we've already mentioned. So to see what a Black author does with a tale of the South written by a white author is an easy yes. And two, I still still feel a jolt thinking about Everett's last novel, The Trees. This man's mind, it has all the brilliance and precision of a diamond saw blade, which is a tool used to abrade and cut through the hardest materials. And what could be harder than dismantling an American classic? Apparently, Everett doesn't meddle much with the original book's environment and plot, but focuses on bringing James to life. In Huckleberry Finn, he's considered simple-minded, useful only for his size and strength. But in James, we'll have access to a real human being whose abilities were never considered by an author like Mark Twain. And that access will be through the mind of Percival Everett, a Black writer of formidable skill who has no time or patience for what the white establishment calls a classic. Once again, I'm drawn to an author like Tommy Orange, who makes me feel deeply uncomfortable while at the same time makes me laugh with the vicious wit he turns on the ruling class 